Welcome to A Fine Time, The Nanny Revisited. This is a podcast about the nanny, where we recap each episode and then discuss, sharing our own unique take on each episode. I'm Bernadette. And I'm Debbie. Today, we're talking about episode 21, Franny's Choice. But first, this week, we're joined by a very special guest, Debbie's mom. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Thanks for joining us, Mom. My pleasure. As usual, we're going to start with a brief summary of the episode. Everyone in the Sheffield house has plans, except for Fran. Coming to her rescue, Val shows up with the latest piece of gossip. Danny Imperiali, Fran's ex-boyfriend, has broken up with Heather Biblo, the woman with whom he cheated on Fran. Fran, of course, had already heard this from the information superhighway, her mother. Val adds that Danny has been asking about Fran and encourages her to go speak to him so this way Fran can dump him. Presumably the next day, Fran arrives at the bridal shop with the kids in tow. Intending to show Danny what he's never going to have again and to give him the cold shoulder, Danny surprises her by asking her to marry him. Given the history of him cheating on her, dumping her, and firing her, Fran has to think about the proposal. She mulls it over with her mother, ultimately coming to the conclusion that she's getting married. After telling Niles the news, she informs Maxwell and Cece is simply elated, to put it mildly. Maxwell helps Fran break the news to the children who are less than enthused, recognizing that they'll eventually lose touch and forget about each other. In response to Maxwell concluding it would be wrong for them to get in the way of Fran's happiness, Niles tells him about when he was in love with Catherine and lost out because he never did anything about it, concluding with, I was remarkably stupid, wasn't I? Fran has packed her things and is preparing to leave, and Maxwell reminds the children to act happy because they shouldn't stand in the way of Fran's happiness. After Danny arrives, Fran realizes that she outgrew him beyond just wearing her high heels and that she doesn't want to be with him anymore. Fran, confident in her decision, takes the family out to the Four Seasons to celebrate being back. Bernadette, do you think I missed anything in that summary? No, that was a great summary as always. Awesome. Thank you. This one, I'm not going to lie, was a little bit longer than I, I tried to, I tried to keep them under 300 words and this one was 310 approximately. So well, that's not too bad over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I ad-libbed a little, but like approximately 310. Mom, did, did we miss anything you want me to add? Same. The oh, ending. Yeah. That which wasn't connected. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Bernadette, would you like to take us to scene one sure. in the kitchen? Yep, we open up in the kitchen and Fran is at the table sewing up uh, Gracie's bear, her uh, teddy bear, and um, Gracie comes in and Fran explains that she has, uh, you know, she, you know, Gracie asks if she's done. She said yes, and she's moved some of the stuffing from the stomach to the lips, and Gracie's like, well, it was supposed to look like a Care Bear, and uh, Fran notes, now it's a Share Bear, Yep, and um Maxwell walks in and and attacks. He's um, getting ready to go out for an event and he's missing um, a stud who isn't. (laughs) Um, Maggie is going to go to the movies with her friends. Brighton wants to tag along. Uh, Maggie, of course, doesn't want him to come and Brighton's, well, all your friends are nice to me. And he notes, well, or she notes, that's because I told them you only have six months to live. Correct. Maggie then asks Fran, what's my curfew tonight? Uh, Maggie is referred to Brighton as a worm throughout this. And so Fran responds, 10 o'clock with a worm, nine o'clock wormless. And what did she choose? Sorry? What what did she choose? Oh, she, 10 o'clock with a worm. (laughs) Exactly. Much better. Brighton's going to go off with Maggie. um, But Niles is also... Uh, busy that evening he's going to go to the butler's association meeting where sometimes they listen to doorbells and don't get up correct a Uh, wild night Mm -hmm. yeah uh gracie comes in and fran's like oh i guess it's just you and me and she's like actually i have a date um you know spaghettios at bernard's and fran's like oh well can i join i can bring my own and and she notes well they're at a fragile kind of relation like point in their relationship so uh, it's just Fran looks at the bear, says, well, Cher, I've got you, babe. Yep. Great reference. Uh, and then Val knocks on the kitchen door and she, um, you know, Fran kind of notes, though, it's official. I peaked in high school. Fr- uh, Val has brought the movie Single White Female and some Slim Fast Bars. 
And as you noted in your summary, she informs Fran, oh, you know, I have big news. And Fran already has heard through the information highway that Danny has broken up with Heather. Yep. Uh, so Val is c- encouraging uh, Fran to get back together with him. Uh, and she even notes you two are meant for each other. And yeah. And Fran's like, well, you know, given everything now, I don't, you know, and uh, she's not enthused by the idea. And then Val, and she even says, there's nothing you can say that would get me back together with him. And then Val says, well, this time you can dump him. And that yeah. kind of is intriguing to Fran. Understandably, right? And I'll just mention that, um in this conversation, you know, Val says, you know, because Val has the news and Fran, of course, knows it already because of her mother, as, as we've both mentioned. And then Val says, but has she something like, has she told you that he's asking about you nonstop? Mm-hmm. And Fran's like, well, you know, when I, when I quit my job, when I dumped him and quit my job at the bridal shop, wait, 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 Val like stops her. And is like, that's not what happened. He fired you, <laughs> you know, he, he broke up with you and then he fired you. And Fran's like, well, it was a long time ago. It's a little fuzzy. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. I was surprised that Val was so for this idea of her getting back together with him, especially given all that happened between the two of them. Thank you. I was going to ask if you were in Val's shoes, would you have encouraged her to get back together with Danny? No, <laughs> no way. Um, now Val did kind of pivot a little towards the end in terms of saying, well, this time you can dump him. Um, so like if Val had been coming from this as a friend, as more of like kind of a revenge type of thing where you just, again, what Fran ultimately does in the next scene, you know, not necessarily get back together, but like kind of try to show him what he's missing. Mm -hmm. Um, That would have been, I think, a little more understandable, but she comes in it by saying you were meant for each other. Right. Yeah. She says, go talk to him, Franny. You two are meant to be together. Mm -hmm. Like I'm with you. I, I don't see it. Mm Mm-hmm. Was there anything you want else you wanted to add to that opening scene? I didn't see it. Um, I thought the whole thing about dumping him was the best thing. Mm-hmm. That that you know was intriguing, and mm-hmm. she said because she Fran said there's nothing you can say to make me you know get back with him, mm-hmm. or nothing you can do. But then she said, what about dumping him? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I guess there are a couple things I want to just add. Um, so one is that, and it only occurred to me as you were pointing it out that Gracie has a dinner date with Bernard, SpaghettiOs with Bernard. I wonder mm-hmm. if that's the same Bernard we saw in the, the episode, The Show Must Go On, the little boy whose mother says, sing out Bernard, sing oh. Bernard, sing. <laughs> that, that would be a fun throwback. It would be. Um, and also like, cause he would be kind of shy and quiet and that that's what we got. Cause you know, he was going to be a, a a mushroom um like so that would sort of also explain why their relationship is in the fragile state and why it would be weird for Fran to tag along Mm -hmm. um so there's that um one thing that in watching this episode multiple times I it caught my attention that when Maxwell comes in Fran says to him wow don't you look handsome do you have a hot date and he says yes but I'm missing a stud and then she says the line that you mentioned before, well, who isn't? Mm-hmm. I wonder, kind of wonder who the date's with, kind of wonder if he's joking, uh-huh. because um, as we will soon see when we jump into to season two, um, he does go on a date. So mm-hmm. yeah, um, that's, that's all I'll say. I'll, I'll save other things for our future fun segment. Um, yeah, um, I guess the only other thing that I thought was amusing is, as you pointed out, Valve's there with single white female and she has a box of slim fast bars. And Fran says, you know, after, you know, Val, after 10 bars, you don't get slim so fast. Mm-hmm. Which I just, it's, it's a good point. So, have you ever watched Single White Female? I have not. I'm not going to lie. I haven't. Um, I you know did. The we can we can talk about it later too, but I have. So I thought that was particularly interesting. But that's their choice of movie. Uh, but let's talk about that during our notable New Yorker segment. Um, 
because I, I'm not gonna lie, I, I Googled it and I think I looked at Wikipedia. So mm-hmm. yeah. So would you like to take us to the bridal shop? I would love to. So in scene two, we're at the bridal shop and, and before we even go in, we see like the storefront and then we go in and Val is all excited and says something like, Mr. Imperiali, Mr. Imperiali, we have a customer, which I thought was a weird thing to say, considering it's Fran. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, Fran's there with the kids and Val questions her and she says, well, I would have tied them to, to the meter, but Mr. Sheffield frowns on that. Mm-hmm. And so Danny comes out and he, actually, even before he comes out, I should say, the kids are there, as, as I mentioned, and Maggie and Brighton are standing next to a naked model, uh, mm-hmm. mannequin, mm-hmm. I should say, a mannequin. And um, Brighton says, look, it's your new boyfriend and he's got your personality too. And she says, and your equipment, which shuts him up for the moment anyway. Um, Danny comes out and he he's like falling over himself, telling Fran she looks like a million bucks. And she... I think this is, again, one of those times where we need to talk about what she's wearing at the moment. Do you agree, Bernadette? Okay. So she's wearing this black and white dress with red buttons, red gloves, and this ugly plastic hat. (laughs) I'm sorry, the hat makes no sense to me. The rest of her outfit is fine. Um, it's It's a very tight fitted dress. It's off the shoulders. So she, her shoulders are totally bare. Um, she's wearing red lipstick to go with the red gloves and the red buttons down the front and on the, the cuffs. Um, is there anything I should add about the dress? Mm-mm. But so Danny says, you look like a million bucks. And she says, oh, it was just something I threw on. And Gracie can't help but pipe in. You changed your outfit 15 times. And Fran recovers by saying she can't count. She's only six. And Gracie says, I'm seven. See what I mean? Um, yeah. And so, you know, Danny thanks Fran for sending the Christmas present to his mother that it was really nice of her. And she says, well, I don't hate her guts. Um, We'll come back to that because I have a question for you on that front. And then, you know, Val takes the kids out and says, let's go see if their quarter is in the the payphone. And so like Fran and Danny are left alone. And, you know, Danny tries to explain, like he tries to... um, excuse his behavior saying I had to have a cheap tawdry affair to really appreciate you and friends like you were with her for six months and he's like well I had to be sure and friends like I could care less and he's like well you know if you could care less why would you come down looking the way you're looking and she says just you know what you're never going to have again and she moves her her already off the shoulder sleeve down further suffer and he says I am and he tells her that he's still in love with her and he he basically kisses his way into her I won't go so far as say good, but her decent graces. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she says to him, no, I'm not going to come back here so I can waste another three years of my life waiting for you to not ask me to marry you. And what does he do to everyone's surprise? He gets down on one knee and asks her to marry him. And, and her response is, you know, you led me on for three years. You cheated on me. You fired me. He kisses her and he says, so, and she says, so I'm going to have to think about it. Mm -hmm. um do you want to add anything or can we talk about some of the elements just just quickly so I thought it was interesting that like one of the first things he says to her is my mother missed you true did you catch like I thought that was interesting because I would I would think that if he's the one you know who truly misses her he would start with him missing her not his mother missing her no that that's a good point although I guess the counter is it's less, um, I don't want to say threatening, but it's less like, he's, he's less like, he's just, he's feeling her out, I think. It's less risky for him to say, my mother miss, misses you. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. But then Go it's ahead. also interesting, again, because then we learn that she's actually still been kind of in touch with his mother. <laughs> right. And, Which to me um, seems weird, right? Mm-hmm. Does that well, seem weird to you? I mean, to, to some extent, I mean, and this is where the timeline kind of, kind of mixes up. Cause like she keeps saying she, he led her on for three years, but we also learn like, she's always dreamt of him asking her, like, there's an implication that they've known each other pretty much their entire lives. Right. 
Well, keep in mind when we watched the episode, the gym teacher at the very end in that last scene with coach stone, they're looking through a yearbook Mm -hmm. and you know, there's a picture of Bran with Danny's arm around her. Yeah. So they've obviously known each other. Like, I guess is the implication that they've known each other, liked each other, but weren't serious until three years prior to the, the series opening. I think that's right. Like they were dating more, maybe more casually, but like they were pre-engaged, if you recall, before she got fired mm-hmm. and he broke up with her. They were like pre-engaged, um, but like they had to be dating for a period before that. And it's also other times, like, you know, when she comments on like her ex-boyfriend's Chevy, like things like when it sounds like they were dating in high school. And so they dated for years after that. And yeah, I mean, her age is all, as, I, as, I, as we've talked the about before, <laughs> yeah, it, it makes no sense. Very clear. But, but so that is to say if they have known each other for that long I can kind of see where maybe like she's known his mother for that long and again if she has no you know issue with the mother there could still I like I know friends whose family has kept in touch with exes before um again I don't think it's common but I think it does happen and it, if if she has known the mother for that long that would make a little bit more sense but still I I don't know (laughs) it it, it is still a little bit odd but well she was keeping in touch with the mother in the hopes of getting Danny back Hmm. that's an interesting thought yeah Hmm. I don't know to me it just seems weird that she would still be in touch with his family yeah like you know when someone breaks up with you they also sort of are severing your relationship with their family generally speaking mm-hmm. um yeah it's 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 yeah it's an interesting dyma- dynamic now the other thing is I don't know if this caught your attention or not but the phrase could care less yeah <laughs> it's like couldn't care less exact no you're absolutely right <laughs> but yeah yeah I mean the the this scene is weird you know, she brings the kids, which is weird, as Val points out. The kids then disappear with Val. It would be really interesting to see what happened after she says, so I'm going to have to think about it. You know, like oh. the kids have to come back at some point. Like, what did you think of her um, face, demeanor, whatever, like as he, she, he keeps kissing her because then it became, you know, he's, she's like, no, I don't want to. And then kiss. And then it becomes less it's it's more garbled or like it's to me almost as if she's drunk a little I don't know how to describe it how would you like it's like her resolve is ebbing away Mm -hmm. right like the the implication he is he is such a good great kisser they have such good chemistry like that she that that stops her in her tracks right Mm -hmm. like there's something between them that's so strong that you know despite everything she's going to think about maybe marrying this Neanderthal to use Maxwell's word Mm -hmm. yeah so was there anything else you wanted to add to that scene I don't think so mom do you want to take a shot at uh summarizing uh, the next scene do you mind Bernadette no go ahead well the next scene we're in the brand's mom's kitchen and the mother is ecstatic and singing a, a Jewish song of happiness and good cheer when she hears that her daughter's getting married, but unfortunately she she thinks that her daughter's marrying Mr. Sheffield mm-hmm. and getting the three children. Uh, so she starts uh, at a couple of different points. She hollers to Morty, her husband, that he can start smoking because now that the daughter is getting married, they can die. Yeah, so the line was, oh, Franny, your father and I have been waiting for this day since the moment you were born, now we can die. Morty, you can start smoking again. And then Fran adds, I haven't said yes. And so Sylvia goes back to the door. Marty, Morty, put away the cigar. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are issues, quite honestly, I find that with her marrying Danny before F and during this episode, he's definitely not Jewish. And that doesn't seem to be a factor at all. And Fran kind of slips at one point when she uh describes but oh how he wooed her 
uh, when the parents were out of town some time back. And then she undoes it by saying, oh, and I told him no boys allowed in the apartment when my parents are away. Mm -hmm. I thought that was clever to try to save herself. Yeah. Although and Sylvia he, didn't really seem to buy it. <laughs> exactly. Sylvia did not seem to believe it at all, which as we will continue through the series, we'll sort of see why Sylvia doesn't believe everything Fran says. Mm -hmm. Right. And then at uh, the end, when she finally realizes that uh, Fran is probably going to marry Danny, she starts doing her dance and song again, but this time kind of changes one of the words. Uh, it sounds like humintashen, which sounds like that she's talking about food because doesn't Fran's mom will often talk about food. Mm -hmm. And um, and then it starts raining because earlier Fran had said, you're going to make it rain, mom. Mm -hmm. And not that that's a song to make it rain, but it did start pouring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, thought, yeah, you I, add? Was, yeah I, I just thought it was interesting, too, at the beginning, again, Sylvia is under the impression it's Maxwell. Um, and she's very, you know, excited about that, even having like the kids, she, you know, she notes that it'll. I think she says Fran's pelvis will thank her for that, um, already having the three. Uh, and at first, when she hears that it's Danny, she says, hey, or I don't know how exactly she said, you know, she's not happy. And, and Fran's like, that was lukewarm. And um, again, she points out at first how, you know, he, he didn't treat her well. Right. And Fran says he cried. And Sophia says, oh, I love a man who cries, except for Jerry Lewis at the end of the tel telephone. And so like him crying is what kind of seems to be the turning point um, yeah. in Sylvia's assessment, because I mean, you know, this is perfect for Debbie's mom being here. Like if you were in this situation, if Debbie came to you and a guy who had cheated on her has now proposed to her, how would you react? I would not be happy because I believe once a cheat, always a cheat. Mm -hmm. And heck, he broke my daughter's heart. Now he's making amends too late. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's kind of how I thought at first it would go when she's not very happy about the news. And then by the end of the scene, she's on board. Yeah. Um, so it, there are other things I think worth noting in the scene, um, you know, it's sort of as you, well, to the first to Sylvia's assumption that it was Maxwell. Fran at one point in the, that part of the conversation says, the boss never marries the help. Like telling her mom, like, get out of here, stop being ridiculous. Um, and then so Sylvia's like, so, so who are you marrying? And she's like, Danny, who do you think? And and what you were getting at before was she gave a lukewarm oi, mm -hmm. not even like a anything else. And and Fran kind of makes a comment, like, you were always so hot to see us together. Why do I get only a lukewarm oi? And Sylvia says, I didn't like the way he treated you during the, that whole Heather Biblo thing. Mm -hmm. um, and before I, I trample on anything else you wanted to say, did you have more you wanted to add? Otherwise, I will keep going in uh, this scene. I mean, you can keep going. Just, again, the, the whole conversation towards the end is being a nanny is a job doesn't she want a life and right that's probably where you were going with that as well, well bef before that actually um Fran basically doesn't know what to do right that's why she's gone to her mom and Sylvia asks her a very good question do you love him and Fran says how do you know how did you know you love you love dad and and Sylvia's like oh that was simple his dimples well, daddy doesn't have dimples not where you could see Sylvia tells her and you know as the conversation continues Sylvia explains that you know her, that Morty always treated her like a lady every weekend he would take me to his favorite restaurant and never once to be let me carry my own tray mm -hmm. and then kind of to the point you made before Fran eventually says I don't know what to do all my life I've been wanting Danny to propose and now that he does I just keep thinking about those three kids and and Sylvia basically says what you said before that you know, don't you want to have a life? You know, I do. So uh, basically Frank concludes the scene. So I guess I'm getting married. And even her, her decision is sort of lukewarm. Yeah, it is. 
like you would think that someone asks you to marry him, like you should be excited, right? Like that's sort of the idea. But that's a clue that it's not meant to be. Exactly. Yeah. All right, Bernadette, you want to take us uh, to scene four, which I believe is in the kitchen? Yes. So we're in the kitchen and it's Fran and Niles. Niles is chopping onions, so he's teary-eyed. But of course, Fran has told him that she's leaving and she assumes he's crying because of her. And she's like, don't worry, we can still meet up and go bowling. Um, and then she sees his teary eyes and she's like, or mini golf. And he notes that is better. Um, and she's trying to figure out where to have the reception. I, I couldn't catch the first name, but the other one's the clan, uh, Benny's clan bar. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the Mongolian barbecue or okay. Benny's clam bar. Um, and I, I thought it was the engagement party, not the reception. Oh, sorry. You're right. Yeah. It, it's fine. But I mean, the party. <laughs> yeah. I mean, your, your assumption of them talking about the reception makes a little bit more sense than the engagement party, but go ahead. Continue. Yeah. Um, but then Niles is trying to help her out by saying, well, which one has the indoor restroom? And Correct. Benny's clam bar it is. Um, mm -hmm. And Niles is like, well, why don't you have it? And he names a restaurant, you know, uh, that I'm assuming is, you know, near them in the city. And Fran says, well, Danny doesn't like to come into town or the city. And um, I'll have to work on that, you know, after we get married. You know, we, we don't have as many interests. And, but she's going to work on that. And Niles kind of dryly is like, oh, yes, because men are so easy to change. <laughs> um, and then it turns out that she has not yet told Maxwell about nope. her getting married. Um, because, again, the whole thing is that if she's going to get married, the assumption is then she's leaving the job. Right. And did you catch why she hadn't told Maxwell yet? Um, I don't have it noted. So if you'd like to share. She said, oh, he's so busy and I don't want to just barge in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I know how much you hate to do that. Yeah. Which obviously for, for our wonderful listeners who've been watching the show with us, we all know she barges in at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a, an empty, false explanation. Yes. She's just avoiding it. Do you blame her? No. I mean, knowing how this turns out, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, she has feelings for him. So she doesn't want to say she's going to wind up with someone else. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, we know that she loves the children. Like she, she, she blatantly admits that, right? To her right. mother. Well, I love the three kids. Um, but I think, you know, she loves just the entire her life as it is. And she doesn't actually want to change or leave, but right. She, and, and also feels like she needs to, I, to have her own life, I guess. Right. And, and to be fair, um, you know, she also tells the children that she loves them. Like if you go back to episode five in season one, here comes the brood. That's the one where Gracie runs away from Manhattan to Flushing. And then in the restroom, Fran is telling her like, yeah, I get paid to take care of you, but I don't get paid extra for loving you. And I do, mm -hmm. you know? So she tells the kids she loves them. So like, she doesn't hide the fact that she loves them at all. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, I have nothing to add to that scene, mom. Do you have anything? All right. So um, I, I guess I'll take us into the office. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. One thing, those two restaurants, neither of them are kosher. Yes, that's, <laughs> I figured as much. <laughs> okay. So into the office we go and Fran, you know, comes in and um, announces that she's getting married and Cece just throws the paper she's holding up and says, woohoo, to who? It doesn't matter. Do you need a dress, a ring, a ride to Temple? I'm feeling positively, positively giddy. I have a million phone calls to make. I'm so happy <laughs> for you, dear. And then she rushes out of, out of the room. Mm -hmm. um, as we all know, she is very excited because now she thinks Fran is no longer going to be, a, be competition for Maxwell. 
Mm -hmm. Cece's gone and you know Maxwell asks her who who she's marrying and she says Danny Imperiali and he says what I can't believe it after he lied and cheated on you with Heather Biblo how could you Mm -hmm. and Fran starts taking it back and she's like well if I could forgive him I think you certainly could and you know so in their conversation he he sort of says like well I couldn't be happier for you and there's this beat and she says, you, you couldn't, well, uh, me too. Like she's forcing herself to be happy. Um, and, you know, she tells Maxwell that she'll stay on until she, he can find someone to replace her. And, she, and he tells her, well, uh, no one could ever replace you, Miss Fine. Who else would show up to breakfast in all those loud, inappropriate bathrobes? Mm-hmm. And so she promises to leave a couple for Niles. Just for a moment, can we imagine Niles showing up to breakfast <laughs> in one of her bathrobes? Um it would be great. He would look fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so Maxwell shakes her hand and says, you'll be greatly missed. And then quickly adds by the children. And she's like, oh, of course I'll miss them too. And anyway, long story short, Maxwell ends up says saying, I'd like to help you with your honeymoon. And her response, oh, well, it's a little breaking with tradition, but I'll ask Danny. And he <laughs> says, Oh, Miss Fine, I meant financially. And she says, oh, well, that'll be nice too. And so he he basically, they have this conversation about like whether she needs to tell the children and she thinks, well, oh, just tell them I'm in the sh- I'm taking a bath, tell them I'm putting on my makeup. Cause he says like in between those two, he says, well, you'll be gone forever. And she's like, oh, well, tell them I'm putting on my makeup. Mm-hmm. And like, he doesn't want to tell that. Ch- she doesn't want to tell the children, but at the very end of the scene, he takes her hand and leads her out to go tell the children Mm -hmm. do you want to add anything to that Bernadette yeah just quickly so um after Cece leaves Fran notes that happy is not a good color on Cece that's a good point Um, but the other thing I think is interesting again that moment you mentioned where he says oh I couldn't be happier and she kind of you can oh Oh yeah, me too. I'm wondering if she was secretly hoping that he would ask her to stay. That's an in. Uh, she's looking for something that she just didn't get. Mm-hmm. Um, but as we'll find out in a later scene, he does offer her. He did offer her more money to see if mm-hmm. she would stay, and that did not work. Yes. Yeah. Um, But it kind of just reminded me of, I mean, a classic trope in like romances or, you know, in different movies, books and stuff is when someone um, says to, you know, a love interest, oh, well, I'm going to go or I'm going to go off with this person. And they're kind of waiting to see how the other person reacts to that. Mm -hmm. Um, whether or not they're going to say no I don't want you to go or if they kind of let's say you're talking to a crush and you're trying to feel out whether or not they like you as well and when you bring something up like oh what if I went out with so and so and they're like oh yeah yeah you should go out with them then you're like to yourself oh I guess that means they you know they don't like me right that's kind of how it felt to me in that moment I don't know if, if you both felt that way as well, or if you interpreted it differently, but that's what it kind of reminded me of. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. Um, and she was expecting a different reaction. She was hoping for a different reaction. And as we learned, he feels like he can't stand in her way in, in the way of her one chance of happiness or what he thinks is her one chance of happiness. Mm-hmm. By keeping aware he's her employer. And, so mm. he has, and he's, you know, respectful of her. Mm. Mm-hmm. The thing about the bath, I just have to add that I remember so many times growing up that my dad would say to my neighbor, when my neighbor would ask, where's my mom? And he'd say, she's in, in Nirvana, she's in the bath. Uh-huh. And she wasn't. So I just thought <laughs> that, you know, reminded me of that. Aww. All right, um, so I guess we're into scene six. Mom, do you wanna start the summary? Okay, here we are uh, in the kitchen, the children around around the table uh, and Fran is there. And uh, as it Aunt Cece comes in calling herself Aunt Cece at some point after the kids are really unhappy. 
uh, because um, they're told that uh, she's going to marry uh, Danny. And what idiot fell for, you know, Danny's getting married. What idiot fell for that loser? Yeah, so that exchange, you know, they come in and we, we Cece's already in the room and she's uncorking a bottle of champagne. Like that's how the scene is starting. And Fran, Maxwell basically forces Fran to tell um, the kids and she st starts with, remember Danny from the bridal shop? And Maggie says, oh, you mean the backstabbing two-timing creep? And Fran smiles like, yeah, well, he's getting married and you're all invited. And so they seem a little excited. And that's when Brighton says, so what idiot fell for that loser? Mm -hmm. And Cece jumps in, I know, I know, and points at Fran. Go ahead, continue. Mm -hmm. No, just that they, uh, needless to say, the kids are very upset. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, Cece calls herself Aunt Cece, but you still have me, Aunt Cece, which is interesting because I know she doesn't know their names. No, that's a running <laughs> joke that Bernadette and I talk about frequently. Um, and we always point out when she actually does get the kids' names right, and I'm, I'm always floored. Yes. And then kind of towards the, uh, she start, she's singing. Um, she, she's a jolly good fellow. Yes. Uh, so she's really happy. And then I think Fran gets her back with, um, you know, something along the lines like, uh, yeah, what makes you happy is a fifth of scotch and a full pack of batteries. A fresh pack of batteries, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> so um, needless to say, there's friction between the two women. Mm -hmm. And uh, one continues to be happy about uh, the ongoing upcoming nuptials, but the future bride does not appear as happy. Yeah. Bernadette, do you want to add some things? Well. I, I kind of noticed again, there's often some like physical humor with Cece and Gracie um, because here, whenever she said, you still have Aunt Cece, she kind of like slaps or taps the top of Gracie's head. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in previous episodes, we've seen Gracie's usually the one who, who gets some of the physical humor whenever Cece's involved. Um, and sometimes, you know, obviously with Fran as well, I, I recall that time she like picked her up to hold her in front of her. Um, right, saying you wouldn't hurt the woman who's carrying your child, would you? Yes, exactly. Um, but it's, it's interesting because Brighton is the one I feel of the children who's immediately vocal yeah. about his displeasure with everything. Um, because again, it, you'll forget you know, maybe we'll keep in touch to start with, but then after a while you'll forget. And um, and everybody at the end of the scene has run out, you know, except for Cece, who is still <laughs> happy with yeah. her champagne. Um, I guess the one thing I want to want to mention is so after it's revealed that it's Fran who's marrying Danny, um, Gracie says, "Wow, this is going to be a problem." Your closet's barely big enough for your clothes. Mm -hmm. And the response is, he's not moving in with her. Well, that's not going to be much of a marriage. Uh -huh. And that's when Brighton starts being vocal, saying, wake up, twerp. Fran's leaving us. Mm -hmm. And like, that's where Fran's like, oh, we'll still see each other on all major holidays, Christmas, 4th of July, back from sale at Lomans. And Brighton's like, yeah, sure. We'll stay in touch for a little while. And then you'll just forget us. And Cece jumps in and we'll forget her. Yes. And that's, I think, what prompts the comment about fifth of scotch. And the... yeah, so Cece says, you know what I do when, when I need some cheering up or when I need to be happy mm -hmm. or something? That's when Fran makes the comment about the scotch and the batteries. Yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah. So obviously the children have not taken the news well. No, no. not at all. All right. Um, do you want to take us to scene seven, which I believe is in the office? Yes. So we are now in Maxwell's office and it's uh, the conclusion of what we assume to be uh, an interview for a new nanny. He's shaking hands. We will call you. And then as the interviewee leaves, when hell freezes over and Niles is kind of like, well, what was wrong with her? She had 20 years experience. She's, you know, a nurse, you know, all these great qualities. And, and Maxwell says, well, she has no style, no sense of humor. Her hair is oddly flat. So essentially, she's not Fran. Correct. Um, and, you know, 
they're talking and she, Maxwell's like, oh, I didn't know it would be so hard to say goodbye. And Niles is like, well, I, you know, not for me. We're going to go to mini golf next week. Um, and again, I'm always, I really find uh, Niles and Fran's friendship really fun and enjoyable to watch. Um, but uh, Maxwell sits at his desk and, and Niles starts saying, well, I was in love once and Maxwell does not give him any response. So Niall says, I said I was in love once. And Maxwell finally looks up and, and says, Oh, are you, are you wanting to tell me about this? Yeah. And so Niles talks about Catherine who used to be a housekeeper and they never really said anything, but th there were looks and winks and shared laughs. Um, but then, you know, she, Again, he never really did anything, and she ended up marrying someone else and leaving the house. And and then Maxwell's like, well, the whole house knew we were making bets as to when you would get together. And that's when, I, th I believe in your summary, you said, you know, Niles notes, well, I was remarkably stupid, wasn't I? Yep. And uh, was I, sir? And it, it's a very pointed remark towards Maxwell. Because Niles is trying to tell Maxwell, don't make the same mistake I did. Um, but Maxwell doesn't quite pick all of that up. <laughs> no, no, he doesn't. Um, so, you know, the, the part of the scene that I thought was most poignant is, you know, um, when Maxwell's sitting at his desk and he kind of says to Niles, who could have known it would be so hard to say goodbye? You know, and he adds later, I just wish to God there was some way to, no, it wouldn't be right to interfere with Miss Fine's happiness. And so that's when Niall starts talking about when he was in love. And what also was amusing, what it was amusing to me is after he told the story that you just shared, he adds, of course, no one knew. And that's when Maxwell jumps in. We all knew, the whole house knew. We were taking bets on when you would get together. And Niles is shocked. Mm -hmm. Mom, do you have anything you want to add to that scene? Well, just a lot of times, you know, the people are aware and uh, the couple involved isn't mm -hmm. different things, you know, whether someone's right for someone or wrong for someone or whether someone's sweet on someone or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree. It, it, it's funny that Maxwell doesn't pick up on that parallel because again, um, you know, Niles thought that nobody else knew about his relationship with Catherine and Max was like, we all knew, but he didn't right. get to, to see the corollary. Maxwell can be very dense sometimes. Yes. But I, I think that that's true for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. You have a certain blind spot to yourself. Correct. Correct. Um, so I, I think we're now in the, the living room. So, um, you know, it's clearly, you know, some, a little bit of time, not much time has passed and the kids are sitting on the couch and they're, they're unhappy and Maxwell is telling them, you know, to try to be happy for Fran, to like be, to act happy. Um, and, you know, Brighton, we can't like, Ma um, sorry, Gracie wants to know, like, why can't we just ask her not to go? And Maxwell is like, well, cause she's our friend and we want her to be happy she wants it, we want it for her or whatever. And Brighton's like, couldn't you just offer her more money? And Maxwell says, I did, it didn't work. <laughs> um, and Niles is like, well, you never offered Catherine more money. I could have had a life. And Maxwell's <laughs> like, well, if Catherine had ever cleaned behind the refrigerator, you might have. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess he wasn't too thrilled with Catherine. Um, and you know, everyone's talking and at some point Gracie chimes in, this is good, we're all venting, it will make us feel better. Maggie turns to her, shut up, Gracie. You're, and then she's like, you're right. I do feel better. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Cece comes in and she's still humming, I think, for she's a jolly good fellow. And she's like, why so long? Can't deny. <laughs> right. She's like singing to herself. She's still ecstatic. And she's like, why so glum? It, it, it is a happy occasion. She's getting married. Oh, you people are so selfish. <laughs> So, you know, Frank, you know, makes her um, entrance and she's carrying these two suitcases and Niles offers to help her. And, you know, she's, she's like, well, maybe just my makeup bag. And he hands her, she hands him the much bigger suitcase. Mm -hmm. 
and you know you know she's kind of still kind of lukewarm about it eventually you know the doorbell rings and we hear Danny shouting about how he's double park you know hurry up blah 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 he comes in and she wants him to you know meet her boss Mr. Sheffield and you know this is I love the the comparison between Maxwell and Danny um you know Danny greets him by saying how's it hanging and Maxwell says I beg your pardon and Fran has to interject we have a little bit of a language barrier here and she elbows Danny Mr. Sheffield speaks English mm-hmm. and you know Cece is still ecstatic and she's trying to help get all the bags out of the car and she says these bags are so old I'm gonna get you a new set for the wedding blah 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 and of course Fran and Niles make a snide comment about CC being an old bag takes one to no one jinx buy me a coke or whatever yeah um and Fran tells Niles that a new scarecrow I'm gonna miss most of all so the first time she's referred to him as scarecrow I don't know because that's the first time I recall (laughs) I think so um but so you know Danny tells her to take one last look around. Your nanny days are over. And Maxwell tells her, we'll certainly miss you. And she says, well, you know, if you're in a bit of a bind, I could work a few days a week, Monday through Friday. And Danny interjects, no way Danny Imperiali's wife is going to take a job. Fran's like, I thought you wanted me to work in the bridal shop. And and he says, yeah, but I wasn't going to pay you. And he's like, come on, honey, you're going to be a lady of of leisure. Should be leisure. You're, you're going to cook and clean and take care of me and the kids and the house and whatever. And she says, yabba dabba do. You mean I don't have to walk Dino too? Um, and and they're, they're sort of, you can tell that she's, she doesn't really like his proposal. Um, and so she starts saying goodbye to the kids and, and Gracie reads this wonderful poem, um, which she wrote for her. F is for the fun we have together. R is for the rummy that we play. We, we play. A is for the answers to my questions and N is for the nasal things you say. Mm-hmm. And she hugs Gracie and she goes, she makes that very nasal sound that, you know, very characteristic of her. And Maxwell says, we're all going to miss that sound. Yeah. And so, you know, she hugs Maggie goodbye saying she'll call her and she goes to hug Brighton and Brighton walks away. And she says, aren't you going to hug me? And she, he says, no, I hate you. Mm-hmm. And and she says, you're not making this easy on me. And he's like, well, you're not making it easy on us. And it comes out that, you know, Maxwell told them to pretend we're happy about it, but but they're not. And as Maggie puts it, we're losing our best friend. And Fran's like, you're telling them to lie about their feelings. I'm not even gone yet. And you're already making mistakes. Uh huh. And so this is where Maxwell really steps up. And he says, you think it's easy for us to watch you walk out the door and throw your life away on that Neanderthal? And it, he's sort of like, you know, passingly says to Danny, sorry, I'm sorry, old man. He's like, Hey, I am younger than you, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And, and Maxwell, you know, says the children will miss you. I'll miss you, but you've all, you've made us all so happy here. We just want you to be happy now. And Fran has this like moment of realization. I don't want to go. And then Danny sort of, sort of belatedly realizes that the sea is changing and he's like, come on, honey, you're embarrassing me here. And Fran, Fran, this, I think this next part shows how good of a person Fran it really is. You know, I don't want to hurt you, but I think I've outgrown you. And he's like, no, honey, you're, you're just wearing heels. Mm-hmm. And she was like, were you always this stupid? And he's like, yeah, nothing's changed. But, you know, he, eventually he gets to the point where he's like, are you dumping me? And she says, I would never come to think of it. I am. It doesn't feel as good as I thought it would. Mm-hmm. And he's like, baby, I love you. And she's like, nah. he, he's like, I still got it. And he kisses her. And she's like, yeah, but I don't want it anymore. Mm-hmm. And his immediate response is to turn to Cece. You want it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and she's like, well, two seconds. Time heals all wounds. And Danny leaves and Cece chases him out saying, well, you know, buy her flowers and chocolates and she needs a new car. I'll pay for everything. Mm -hmm. Um, We'll win her back. And, you know, he's gone. And so they decide that they're going to go out to the four seasons to to celebrate. And Maxwell's like, it's my treat. And she's like, no, no, I'll pay. He's like, I insist. And she's like, I'll use the money you gave me for the honeymoon. Wow. You never thought you'd see that again anyway. And Mm -hmm. 
as they're leaving, and this is one of many times that we'll see throughout the series where there's a very meaningful moment at the door. And Maxwell says to her, I just hope you made the right decision. And she smiles at him and says, I did. Mm -hmm. So sorry. I realized as I was like in the middle of this, that this is a very long scene. So sorry, I have to listen to my, my nasal voice for longer than usual. Um, Bernadette, is there anything you want to add to that? Just wanted to add that when we first hear Danny yelling from outside, Cece says, he sounds charming. And he's, he, she rushes to the door to kind of get him, hurry him up. And, um, Fran and Niles have their usual kind of banter that, you know, that woman could deliver for Domino's if, if it's not hot, it's free, that kind of stuff. So Mm -hmm. that was their kind of banter there too. But yeah, I think you did a great job summarizing that scene. Um, This is obviously, um, it's interesting, like, again, the kids tell her she doesn't want to, they don't want her to go. Maxwell, you know, notes that they'll miss her and stuff, but it's Fran ultimately who realizes that she doesn't want the life that Danny's kind of presented for her. She wants to stay. She's outgrown him. Um, And I think just acknowledging that sometimes what you want in life changes even though she always wanted him, you know, to marry him when she was younger, she's, she's grown (sighs) since then. She had, I mean, being exposed to the finer things in life for the past, you know, almost year has had an impact. And I think the love she has for the family. That's true. And Mr. Sheffield is single and very available. (laughs) I I wanted to just mention two things with the suitcases. I thought it was kind of cute. Yes, he, you know, her bigger one had her uh, beauty supplies in it, but quite honestly, the smaller one is the one that's called the makeup bag. Yes. (laughs) You know, when when you're picking out luggage. And just to say, in case people didn't realize, maybe everyone knows, but you know, whatever, but the reference about the scarecrow is from the Wizard of Oz. Oh, okay. Um, he, the scarecrow didn't have, was he the brain? The brain. Yes, there's a scene at the end, um, I think of the Wizard of Oz, where she, where Dorothy says, and I missed you most of all, when she was, you know. Okay. Okay, so that wasn't just a pet name she had for him, yeah. for him that we never heard before. It was a reference to that line. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, I guess Mom, you would like to do the last little bit. Yeah. Interestingly, the last, the very last scene seems to not be connected to the whole uh, episode that we've so far seen, except, well, I don't know. Anyway, a friend is on an airplane and has just sat down in first class and there's a nice looking gentleman sitting at, on the seat and next to him is his daughter. And um, he mentions that he's a CBS executive. And she says, oh, I have a, a situation comedy to tell you about and starts ta- describing uh, the nanny. And uh, he asks the uh, stewardess, how soon is it until we're gonna land? And picks up his variety newspaper, which is a actor's kind of uh, paper without you know shows, etc. And I don't know, the title or the article, main article said, closing global glitter gaps. So I don't know if that related to her and her dresses and her whatever, but uh, it was kind of weird. And I wondered if that was supposed to be the honeymoon that she was supposed to go on with Danny. And that's why she was now on an airplane. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it, as you mentioned, it does seem kind of disconnected from the actual episode. And my thought was, I was wondering if this episode was originally going to be the season finale because it feels like a season finale. It does. And and that, and that last bit as well, it's funny because she's reciting, 
she's like pitching her story and she's actually reciting the lyrics to the theme song. And so I would have thought this would have been a perfect season finale, this episode, plus that little bit at the end, because it kind of jokingly shows, you know, how, how the show came to be, even though in the scene, she's acting as if she is Fran Fine. So not Fran Drescher. Um, Right. I don't know. Did you did you both feel too that this seemed more like a season finale episode? I thought so as, as well. Like this would have been a better place to end season one. Yes. Yes. Yes, especially I like the twinkle in her eye at the end of the scene before. Mm-hmm. That she made the right decision. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um it, you're right. It, it definitely feels like it should be the end of season one, but there's one more episode, so it was not. Um, the one thing I will mention about the the last scene that has nothing to do with anything else is that she upgraded herself from coach, mm-hmm. which yeah. was amusing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, Bernadette, is there anything you want to talk about before we get into our shticks? Again, I think I already kind of mentioned just how I felt like this is overall felt like a season finale, which is why I was surprised. I even like looked up on um, like on on Wikipedia to make sure I watched the episodes in order, (laughs) you know, I didn't accidentally skip to the last episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, It felt like that. Yeah. Um, So which of our sticks would you like to start with? Well, let's just start with favorite fashion. Okay. Um, so we've already talked about the the outfit she wore in the bridal shop. Mm-hmm. Um, I will just note with that, Debbie, it kind of, it doesn't look exactly like it. It just kind of gave me a pretty woman vibe. Oh, that's fair. Mm-hmm. Yes. And again, it kind of felt like, well, this is the outfit I'm going to show what, you know, Danny, what he's missing, kind of the revenge outfit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so again, not necessarily, you know, I wouldn't necessarily wear the hat, but it felt like that's kind of in that time period. <laughs> I think it would have been so much better without the hat. Mm-hmm. The hat to me just makes no sense. Um, what I will say about fashion, I think it's worth noting that the the suit that Fran is wearing in the, the last substantive scene, um, it's the black suit with the leopard print hat. It has a matching hat and it's on the lapels. I believe that's the suit she was wearing in episode one where she rang the doorbell oh, before she got the it job. It looks familiar. It did look familiar. I just didn't quite place it. So there, there's sort of a nice circularity, which I think adds to what you said before, that this feels like the end of season one, mm-hmm. even though it's not. Um, Mom, is there any fashion you want to mention? No. Okay. Bernadette, do you have others? I have a few others I'd like to mention, but... I'll give you a chance to talk Go ahead. I don't really have too strong of an opinion. So I liked a lot of the fashion in this episode, um, but not necessarily the like bigger things. Um, I liked, I sort of liked what she, I liked the top half of what she was wearing in the scene at her mother's house. It was like a purple button down shirt with a, a vest with like some flowers, I think on it and like other colors. I liked that. I also really like the multicolor button down shirt she was wearing in the last scene on the airplane. Um, I did not like Maggie's Friday night attire where she, it's like a red jacket with, with jeans. It just, it looked like something Fran would wear, not necessarily something Maggie would wear. Um, Do you think she went into Fran's closet? (laughs) Oh, I think that happens all the time and it's going to continue to happen as we move forward. Um, So that's very possible. Um, and then I guess this sort of will help us transition if you don't mind into our nineties nostalgia, but, um, the shirt that Danny is wearing and actually Danny's attire in the last, the last real scene, it's like that patterned button down shirt that he has open as a V-neck and the high jeans. To me, that looked very dated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of like from, uh, Saturday night fever. (laughs) Yeah. So that, that I think helps us transition into our nineties nostalgia. Um, is there anything you, you picked up that you want to talk about Bernadette? Well, just to uh, start out with that again, when in the beginning scene where Fran's like, I already know from, you know, my mother, I think 
today as well, like it would be like Facebook or other forms of social media or text messages where you would get all this kind of information. Like for instance, like if he's on Facebook and it shows like he broke up, right? <laughs> or, you know, so uh, that was just interesting. We have a different way of getting our information. Although, you know, sometimes still moms are great <laughs> at, at, at getting us the information as well. Right. Um, but also I thought it was interesting that Fran described her mother as the information superhighway, mm -hmm. which is, I would think of the internet today. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it goes to your point that also, also to your point, like if it were today, Danny probably wouldn't have been asking Val so much, but he probably would have been texting Fran. Yes. Or like sliding into her D, trying to slide into her DMs or whatever. Did, mm -hmm. I, did I use that phrasing right? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Um, I try. I, I, I try to be topical. <laughs> um, I've already mentioned this before, but like Val's way to get the kids out of the bridal shop was let's go check the payphone for quarters. Mm -hmm. There are very, very few payphones <laughs> left. Yes. Well, um, and that makes me think too, the, her bringing over a movie. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Now you would just stream it or rent it, you know, from your TV, not necessarily stop by somewhere to pick it up. There are, there are very few places now to stop to pick up a video. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a good point. Um, Bernadette, were you going to tell us something about that movie? Oh yeah. Um, uh, I can go ahead and tell it now or during the notable New Yorker segment. Oh. either way yeah we, we why don't we jump into our notable new yorkers other than i will say old cars and old car keys so <laughs> um so i watch single white female with my college roommates <laughs> um and so it's been a little while i'm not gonna say how long uh but my recollection that the, the kind of premise of it is that um this one woman starts like just uh, imitate, like dressing the same way as the main character, essentially trying to kind of take over her life. Um, and so I thought that was in an interesting choice for just like a girl's night movie. Um, I still remember there was a very memorable scene that I'm not going to get too much into that involved uh, the heel, uh, the high heel. <laughs> but but yeah I mean I don't know Debbie if when you were looking it up if there was anything in particular that kind of stuck out to you as to why maybe they would have mentioned it here I think it was the timing so I, I looked at I looked on one of our favorite web pages Wikipedia and the, it was described as an American psychological erotic thriller from 1992 mm -hmm. so about two years then before Correct. Out. Correct. So, so probably around the time that it was coming out on VHS. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That was sort of what I figured. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, again, it, it's, yeah, it is a psychological kind of <laughs> movie. So uh, I'll take it as your suggestion that it was just timing wise with that unless because I don't know what eventually happens with Val I don't know if she ever goes crazy <laughs> but um yeah. uh spoiler no Val does okay. not go crazy. <laughs> okay good so. she doesn't turn into the single white female okay good no no but I mean we'll, we'll probably talk about this in a couple weeks but you know Val is sort of set up as like the less vivacious less successful less smart or I guess dumber friend compared to Fran so yeah um but there are plenty of references in here I don't know if you guys want to start or how we want to do this because there were quite a few oh interesting I didn't catch that many so um so I mean just in the first scene alone I mean I'm sure you caught like Care Bear and Cher, Care Bear and Cher yeah and the and the lyric I've got you babe Right. It was a Sunny and Cher lyric. Yep. 
single white female, slim fast bars, which again seems very 90s in some respects. I mean, oh. they're, they're still around, but I feel like, like, particularly during that time period, I could be wrong, but. That's fair. Um, were there any that you wanted to talk about before we got into more? I'm trying to remember. Oh, I, I don't think there's anything else in that scene. I think in the scene with, um, with Sylvia, I have a handful. Yes. Yes, there's quite a few. You guys can take that if you want. So there was a reference to Tony and Angela. Mm -hmm. I think our characters from the American sitcom, Who's the Boss? Yes, which that's was what I assumed. Okay. So for, for those who have not seen it, according to Wikipedia, it is a sitcom about a former baseball player who uh, had to retire and he, become, he becomes the housekeeper for a divorced woman. Um, there was Major Nelson and Jeannie and Jeannie's mm -hmm. apartment slash bottle. So that's from I Dream of Jeannie. Yes. Um, those were the two I, I wrote down. Dabba dabba do. That's, that's, yeah, that, that's later. Did, did you have any others in, uh, was that scene three? I don't believe so. I think those are the two major ones from that. Huh. And then other ones I had were there was a reference to dominoes. And as you pointed out, if, if she doesn't come hot, she's free. Mm -hmm. um, Dino, Dino and Yabba Dabba Do are references to the Flintstones. And then there's the Four Seasons, which was an upscale restaurant in Midtown Manhattan, which permanently closed in June of 2019, according to Wikipedia. Also, according to Wikipedia, it was, I, it was uh, frequented by customers like Bill Clinton, Jack Kennedy, and others. Um, it is the restaurant that it was the restaurant that was credited with introducing the idea of changing a menu based on the season. It was the first like um, the way it was written was like it was the first um, restaurant to print menus in English. Um, it was the first uh, restaurant to cook fresh wild mushrooms and cotton candy was considered a house specialty. So all that's from our friends at Wikipedia. Interesting. Did you catch it? Others? Well, yeah. Debbie's mom. <laughs> no, she doesn't have any. She's shaking her head. I mean, she mentioned the scarecrow one, which is good. Um, we mentioned for she's a jolly good fellow. And this is just, this is not an actual reference. It's just where my mind went. Have you ever watched the movie Clue? Because <laughs> anytime I hear that song now, I think of a scene in Clue. But um, I know I have but I clearly don't remember it as well as you do. Okay, so you need to watch it again. <laughs> um, we'll watch it together next time, but- um, Sounds good. But yeah, so she's a jolly good fellow. And again, that CC, you know, does a refrain to that later as well. And right. um, there was another one I was thinking. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, they mentioned Neanderthals, which again, it's. It's so fitting, but yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, that's space. And obviously I'm think I'm assuming that the man who is playing the CBS executive was actually the CBS executive, but I did not double check that. That's an interesting question. I will find out. Um. Our, our friends at IMDb is, are fantastic about listing who is in the in each episode. Um, is it possible that it was? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think he might have actually been a an actor. Oh, really? Okay. Trying to figure that out. Um, I think his said his name is Jeff. Yeah. So Jeff Sagansky. Oh, he was a producer, production manager, and actor. Okay. From uh, Wellesley, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, so would you like to tell us, uh, take us to the Yiddish Cup? Sure. Um, well, we've already covered a bunch of things. Um, so mom has already pointed out that the restaurants that Fran was considering having her engagement party were not kosher. Um, so 
point one, point two, uh, Silvio was singing Simantov Mazeltov, uh, which is a song that is traditionally sang at or sung at Jewish simchas or good events, so like life cycle events like weddings. Um, she uses the phrase Mazeltov, which we've I think defined previously as congratulations. Uh, Simantov means good tidings. Um, as Mom pointed out, the lyrics that Sylvia sings the second time aren't quite right. <laughs> So that's interesting. Um, I think that's it for Yiddish Akap. I, I have a question. I couldn't quite catch. It's during the scene at Sylvia's apartment when they're talking about the whole thing. It's after the lukewarm oi, you know, kind of thing. I, I thought she might have called him a trumpernick or something like that. Is that Yiddish? Or did I totally just mishear what was happening? <laughs> I don't recall that exchange, so I'm I'm not gonna. Okay. Does does that word sound anywhere close? To Try to say it again. Trumpernick, or something like that. Um. Well, we're we're gonna go to our friends at uh, Google, um, and <laughs> their their responses. It looks like there aren't many great matches for your search. Okay. <laughs> So either I totally misheard that or I don't know, but that's, I, I had a question mark next to that in my notes. So um, I wish. It's, it's around the time that Sylvia is saying that she didn't like how Danny treated her. Yeah, I, I wish I had later. That's fine. Yeah. I wish I had something better to say than um, I don't know. So okay. I apologize. That's, that's fair. <laughs> I, I apologize, not just to you, Bernadette, but to all of our wonderful, wonderful listeners that I'm failing miserably. No, no <sighs> not. again, I could have just totally misheard it as well. So do we have any future fun you'd like to share? We do. We do. We always have future fun. Um, so first and uh, most broadly speaking, this is not the last we hear of Danny Imperiali and Heather Biblo. In fact, we're actually going to meet Heather Biblo on, I believe, two occasions, including one where she ends up working in the Sheffield home. So stay tuned for that. Um, this is not the only proposal Fran gets. I can think of at least four other men who ask her to marry her. Um, wow. <laughs> this is also not the only time that Sylvia thinks that it was Maxwell. Um, so kind of to the point you were getting at before about how Niles was, you know, sort of dropping hints to Maxwell, like, don't be as dumb as I was type thing. This is not the only time that he does that. And, you know, unsurprisingly, he starts dropping hints to Maxwell. He drops hints to Fran. Sometimes he is more subtle than others. So we will see him being far less than subtle at some point. Um, and then I guess the, the last point I wanted to make is that um, the Sheffields actually hire another nanny in season six, which I think I've mentioned previously. Mm -hmm. So um, stay tuned. Okay. So I, I think we're now up to our episode rating. Um, as a reminder, for those who only who don't listen to us every week, we rate each episode on a scale of one to five lipsticks with one being the worst and five being the best. Is it my turn or your turn? I think it's my it's turn. your turn. <laughs> Eat it when it's my turn. Um, so the more we've talked about this episode, the more I've liked it. And this is not an episode I dislike. Um, I've just enjoyed it. I've enjoyed parsing it with you more than I've enjoyed watching it on my own. Um, I do think I liked it better than Ode to Barbara Joan, which we did last week. I don't like it as much as Here Comes the Brood. Um, so I'm going to give it a four and a half. Okay. How about you, Bernadette? Um, so again, struggling with it, but I think I might just give it a five. Um, oh, wow. I think okay. it would have been like, well, because I, I kind of like the, uh, I'm frustrated with Fran, but I also kind of like the trope of like, people realizing what they mean to you type of thing <laughs> so mm -hmm. um again I think it would have been perfect as a finale episode for the season um but still I I enjoyed it um but yeah I'd be interested to know what your mom thought 
if she had to rate it, what she would give it. Well, before Debbie said four and a half, I was thinking of a four and a half. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, the part I'm taking away from is, as you gals have said, that it wasn't the final episode of that season. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that you know disappointing, not only because of the sparkle in her eye, but also because you know I, they added that plane segment in. Mm -hmm. But uh, to me, um, it's just also interesting that it's okay the first season and you already know there's a spark between uh, the two main characters mm -hmm. but we have a lot more seasons and episodes to go yes <laughs> we do we have another like 120 something episodes so you know i'd say i like all the characters i think they're well well suited the actors who were you know picked for them really you know do a good job mm -hmm. One one thing mom mentioned to me, I, I kept having to tell her to save it for the podcast because as we were watching it or right afterwards, she was like, she tried to make comments. One thing she said to me before, but she didn't mention now, so I'm going to make her mention it, is that she, the timing of this episode doesn't really make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. she's, right, not sure about if she's getting married, then all of a sudden she's leaving the, the Sheffield home already. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah, I, that's a good point. Because, I mean, again, unless it was going to just be a courthouse wedding or something, you, you would imagine that it would take at the very least a couple of weeks, you know, but typically months, if not a year or two when you're engaged to make all of the arrangements and to actually have it. And yeah. Right. Although, so although as we saw stop, in Stop the Wedding, I Want to Get Off, you know, you could get married next week. If you do it, that's sort of low key. That's true. <laughs> but no, well, but you don't even know if they had that engagement dinner. They didn't, right? Like we would have probably seen it, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, so yeah, there's, there is a suspension whenever we're, you know, like it's a 20 something minute sitcom. So they <laughs> squeeze it in. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that, that the timeline is a bit um, off which we've kind of noted before, I think, in some of the other episodes. Right. And I guess going go along that line or against that line was that he was already interviewing a prospective nanny. So more time might have passed than the viewer was aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it's also sort of one of those things, kind of as you put it with the suspension of disbelief, that like, if more time had passed, that would have been more opportunities for the children to tell Fran how unhappy they are, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, in the episode, Here Comes the Brood, where they went to the, the zoo with Cece and, you know, Cece says something like, well, she, your beloved nanny gets paid to spend time with you. I did it for nothing. And, and, and poor little Gracie runs off and like Maggie follows her. Like realistically, Maggie and Gracie would have had a conversation there. Here, realistically, one of the kids would have said something to Fran mm -hmm. if there was too much time that passed. So, yeah, the timing doesn't really make a lot of sense, but I don't think it detracts. Obviously, considering how highly we've all rated this episode, it did not detract enough yeah. to, to cut the, the rating down. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Well, that's all we have for you today. We hope you had a fine time with us as we revisited the nanny. Join us next week when we'll be discussing episode 22, I Don't Remember Mama. If you'd like to reach us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Nanny Revisited. You can also send us email at a fine time nanny revisited at gmail.com. Have a great week.